Personal development is truly the key to the good life. You see, what you become is far more important than what you get. The most important question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting? The most important question is, what am I becoming? However, it is also true that what you become directly influences what you get. Most of what we have, we have attracted by the person we have become. So here's the great challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That is the great focus of attention for life change. Now, on the other side of the coin, it reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you've got. I've discovered that income does not usually exceed personal development. Sometimes income takes a lucky jump, but unless you keep growing out where it is, it will usually come back where you are. If someone hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly so you can keep the money. Life has strange ways. A very rich man once said, if you took all the money in the world and divided it equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. I guess it is hard to keep what you haven't attracted by your own personal development. Personal development, how important. Remember, the major key to your better future is you. That's a sentence with a lot of value. I suggest you put it up somewhere for a while where you can see it every day, just to remind you as you put your day together. I call it the silent seminar. The major key to your better future is you. For a share of my life, I didn't understand the importance of that phrase. Among a lot of things I didn't understand back in those early days. Back then, some things used to puzzle me. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company and one make twice as much money. Why would one person be paid $2,000 a month and the other person $4,000 if it was the same company, same product, same service, same training, same weather, same traffic? Maybe they were the same age and went to the same school. Wouldn't that be a puzzle? Why would one person do twice as well? Speaking economically. I know there are many ways to do well, but in this narrow area called compensation, what is the difference? What is the difference between 2000 and 4000 a month? And I don't mean 2000 I could figure that out. Well, back then I tried to figure it out best I could. I thought time makes some of the difference. Some people do better because they have more time. I used to say, Harold ought to do well. He's got a lot of time. If I had all of Harold's time, I could do well. Now, that's got to be dumb, right? You can't get someone else's time. A man once said to me, if I had some extra time, I could make some extra money. I said, then you have to forget it. There isn't any more time. Where would you find any? Hey, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, that's about it. It's over. There isn't any more time. If you insist on finding more than 24 hours a day, they will come and take you away. So if we can't get more time, what could we get that would make the difference in economic results? And the answer is value. Value makes the difference. You can't get more time, but you can become more valuable. So value makes a major difference in how much money you earn. Now, here's a primary lesson in economics. We get paid for value. Bringing value to the marketplace is how we get paid. Whether you work on a job or whether you bring goods and services, we get paid for the value. Now, I know it takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but you don't get paid for the time. You get paid for the value. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm getting $20 an hour. And the correction is, no, not for the hour. If that was true, you could just stay home and have them send you your money. No, you don't get paid for an hour. You get paid for the value you put in an hour. An hour is simply a convenient way to measure the value. So one of the important questions to ask is, is it possible to become twice as valuable and make twice as much money in the same time? Could you become three times as valuable and make three times as much money in the same time? And the answer is, of course. 
Yes, you can become more valuable if, and it's always if, right? Life is known as the big if. Harry Truman once said, life is iffy. How true. And here's the big if we are going to consider. It's possible to earn two or three or more times as much money in the same amount of time if you go to work primarily on yourself. And that's what we're considering in this session. Learning to work primarily on ourselves. Mr. Shelf put it to me this way when I first met him. He said, Mr. Rohn, if you wish to be wealthy and happy, learn this lesson well. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. When he said that, I suddenly understood why I was broke. I was a hard worker on my job. If anyone would have asked me at age 25, Mr. Rohn, are you a hard worker? I would have said, yes, I'm a hard worker. Check my record. And that was true. I was a hard worker. But see, that was my problem. I was working hard on my job, but I wasn't working hard on myself. And that was the main reason for my lack of progress. See, it's easy to get faked out. The man says, I've got 10 years of experience. I don't know why I'm not doing better. What he doesn't understand is that he probably has one year of experience repeated 10 times. He grew pretty well that first year, and then he just did that first year nine more times. He didn't keep growing. Some people look for more money, but they look for it in the wrong direction. The man says, I need more money. I'm going to go to work on my boss. Hey, I found out bosses are notorious. They don't play fast and loose with the company till. I've never seen a boss get excited and triple somebody's wages. They don't behave in such an irrational manner. So that's not it. Some people say, I'll strike for more. Well, the problem with that is, once you start, you'll always have to strike. And I'll tell you what you get by demand. Little bitty pieces. Barely enough. And now inflation beats that approach, right? Inflation will usually equal or exceed a small wage increase, especially after taxes. Forget the little increases that just let you get by. Hey, you can get by with a crust of bread and a pair of shoes. But in this program, we are talking big success, not just getting by. The guy in sales says, I know what I'll do. I'll get me some of those sales books that teach the tricky sales. I'll put it on my prospects, dazzle them with my sales footwork, grab their money before they know what's happened. Well, you can try that, but my experience shows you wind up at the bottom of the economic ladder not the top. See, it's not what you get by tricks that counts. It's not what you get by demand. It's what you get by performance that counts. And I found this out. Performance comes from inside, not outside. For the first part of my life, I was looking for the answers outside before I finally discovered they were inside. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you develop. People are often asking me, how do you develop an above-average income? And the answer is, become an above-average person. Develop an above-average handshake. Some people want to be successful, and they don't even work on their handshake. As easy as that would be to get started on. They let it slide. They don't understand. Develop an above-average smile. Develop an above-average intelligence. Develop an above-average interest in other people. Develop an above-average intensity to win. See, that will change everything. Probably one of the most frustrating experiences in life is looking for an above-average job with above-average pay without becoming an above-average person. It's called frustration. Mr. Shelf one day gave me one of the most important statements of our entire association. I was giving him a rundown on how things hadn't worked out for me, and he said... Mr. Rohn, I have an answer for you if you will listen carefully. And listen carefully I did that day and for the next five years. If someone is wealthy and happy, you've got to listen. He said, Jim, I've only known you for a short time, but it is my honest opinion for things to change for you, you've got to change. That was not quite the answer I was looking for, but that's the one he gave me. 
And now I bring it to you after pondering it all these years. For things to change for you, you've got to change, no matter what successes you've already achieved. Otherwise, it isn't going to change for you. Before I met Mr. Schof, I used to say, I sure hope things will change. That seemed to be my only hope. If it wasn't going to change, I was in serious trouble. Then I found out it wasn't going to change, and I was in serious trouble. Hey, remember, it isn't going to change. Not long ago, I did a seminar for a group of oil company executives during their convention in Honolulu. Sitting around this conference table, one of them asked, Mr. Rohn, you know some important people around the world. What do you think the next 10 years are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. I can tell you. So they all listened very carefully. I said, gentlemen, based on the people I know, and from the best of my own experience, I've concluded that in the coming 10 years, it's going to be about like it's always been. Aren't you glad you're listening? I don't share that with just everybody. Now, I said that to make a point, but I also said it because it's accurate. It's going to be about like it's always been. The tide comes in, and then what? It goes out. For six and a half thousand years that we know of called recorded history, and probably long before that, so it's not likely to change. It gets light, and then what? It turns dark for 6,000 years. We are not to be startled by that now. If the sun goes down and the man says, what's happened, what's happened? Surely he just got here, I guess. Hey, it always goes down about this time of day. In rotation, the next season after fall is winter. And pray tell, how often does winter follow fall? Every time, without fail, for 6,000 years that we know of. Now, some winters are long and some are short. Some are difficult and some are easy. But they always come right after fall. It isn't going to change. Sometimes you can figure it out. Sometimes there's no way to figure it out. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it gets in a knot. Sometimes it sails along. Sometimes it gets in reverse. See, that's not going to change. The last 6,000 years reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. That's how it reads. It isn't going to change. The man says, well, then how will my life change? And the answer is, when you change. Whether I'm talking to high school kids or business executives, my message is always the same. The only way it gets better for you is when you get better. Better is not something you wish. Better is something you become. Let me take some time now and give you what I think are the four major lessons in life to learn. Four major lessons. It is so important to study the majors. Have you ever noticed that some people don't do well because they major in minor things? Whatever you do, check at the end of the week, the end of the year, and make sure you're not spending major time on minor things. Otherwise, you will wind up with a below average life. Now, before I get to the four major lessons, here are two phrases to consider. First, life and business are like the changing seasons. That's one of the best ways to illustrate life. It's like the seasons that change. Frank Sinatra sings, life is like the seasons. Here is the second phrase. You cannot change the seasons, but you can change yourself. Now, with those two key phrases in mind, here are the four major lessons in life to learn. The first is, learn how to handle the winters. They come right after fall with regularity. Some are long, some are short. Some are difficult, some are easy. But they always come right after fall. Remember, it isn't going to change. Now, there are all kinds of winters, right? The winter when you can't figure it out. The winter when it all goes smash. Winter time, we call it the winters of your life. One writer called it the winter of discontent. The winter when it turns upside down, when it all goes wrong. There are economic winters, social winters, personal winters. When your heart is smashed into a thousand pieces. 
Wintertime, disappointments. Disappointment is common to us all. So learn how to handle the winters. You must learn how to handle the nights. They come right after days. You must learn how to handle difficulty. It always comes after opportunity. You must learn to handle recessions. They come right after expansions. It isn't going to change. So the big question is, what do you do about the winters? Well, you can't get rid of January simply by tearing it off the calendar. But here's what you can do. You can get stronger, you can get wiser, and you can get better. Make a note of that trio of words. Stronger, wiser, better. See, the winters won't change, but you can. Before I understood this, when it was winter, I used to wish it was summer. I didn't understand. When it was difficult, I used to wish it was easy. I didn't know. Then Mr. Schof gave me the answer from a part of his very unique philosophy when he said, Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Here's the second major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to take advantage of the spring. Spring is called opportunity. And uniquely enough, spring follows winter. And pray tell how often. Is it reliable? Can you count on it? Well, 6,000 years that we know of, that's pretty reliable. And what a great place for spring right after winter. If you were going to put it somewhere, that would be the place to put it. God is a genius. Hey, days follow nights. Isn't that terrific? Opportunity follows difficulty. Expansion follows recession. And all with regularity. You can count on it. However, make a special note of the two words. Take advantage. That is what we must learn to do. Take advantage. Just because spring comes is no sign you're going to look good in the fall. You must do something with it. In fact, everyone has to get good at one of two things. Planting in the spring or begging in the fall. So take advantage of the day. Take advantage of the opportunity. And read every book you can get your hands on to learn how to take advantage of the spring. And one more thought. Get busy quickly on your springs. Your opportunities, there are just a handful of springs that have been handed to each of us. Life is brief even at the longest. The Beatles wrote, life is so short. And for John Lennon on the streets of New York, it was extra short. But it is short. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind. Life is fragile, life is brief. Whatever you're going to do with your life, get at it. Don't just let the seasons pass, pass, pass. The third major lesson in life to learn is learn how to nourish and protect your crops all summer. Sure enough, as soon as you've planted, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And here is the next bit of truth. They will take it unless you prevent it. And that is the third major lesson to learn, major skill to develop, preventing the intruder from taking the good. Here are two key phrases to consider under the third major lesson. Number one, all good will be attacked. That's the first phrase. On this planet, all good will be attacked. And don't press me for a why. I was not in on some of the early decisions. So I don't know why. All I know is, it's true. Let reality be your best beginning. Every garden will be invaded. Not to think so is naive. Here's the second phrase. All values must be defended. Social values, political values, friendship values, marriage values, family values, business values. Every garden must be tended all summer. If you don't develop this skill, you will never wind up with anything of value. Last is the fourth major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to reap in the fall without complaint. That's number four. Take full responsibility for what happens to you. It is one of the highest forms of human maturity, accepting full responsibility. It's the day you know you have passed from childhood to adulthood, accepting full responsibility. 
And learn how to reap in the fall without apology. Without apology if you have done well, and without complaint if you have not. That's the best of human maturity. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's the best. Now, I used to have some problems in this area way back in those early days. I used to have this list of reasons why I wasn't doing well. To explain, right? Otherwise, you're going to look bad. I used to have this funny list called reasons for not looking good. I really did. I used to blame the government. You can believe that or not. It was at the top of my list. I had a lecture second to none. The government. I blame taxes. Look what you've got left after they take everything out. Taxes, that was on my list. I blamed prices. That's easy, right? You walk into a supermarket with $20 and come out with this little half bag of groceries. That was on my list. I blamed the weather. I blamed the traffic. I blamed my car. I blamed the manufacturers. I blamed my negative relatives. They were always putting me down. I blamed my cynical neighbors. They were just selfish, looking out for themselves. Wouldn't loan me any money. I blame the community. I blame the economy. Hey, that's a pretty good list for not doing well, isn't it? I thought it was a good list. I will never forget this one day. Mr. Shope was very kind, but he was also very blunt, which was helpful for me. If he hadn't been blunt, I would have missed some things. On this particular day, with a kind of question mark look on his face, he said, Jim, just out of curiosity... Tell me how come you haven't done well up until now. Excellent question, right? Well, so I wouldn't look too bad, I decided to go through my list. How I ever had the nerve to do that, I don't know, but I did. I went through the whole list. The government, taxes, prices, everything. He was very patient and let me go through it all. When I finished, he looked over my list very carefully and said, Mr. Rohn, big problem with your list. You aren't on it. How brilliant. And how true. When I went to work for him a few months later, I learned very quickly to tear up my list of reasons for not looking good and threw it away. And then I got a fresh piece of paper and I put one word on it. Me. There's a black heritage spiritual that says, It's not my mother nor my father, nor my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. See, I used to blame everything outside for my lack of progress until I found the problem was inside. For a big share of my life, I kept looking for the answers to do well outside, and I found out the answers were inside. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you become. You see, it's not what happens that determines the quality or the quantity of your life. It's not what happens. And the reason is because what happens happens to about everybody. The sun went down on all of us last night, a common event. And I found out the same things can happen to two different people, but one gets rich and the other stays poor. Why is that? It's because it's not what happens, but rather it's what you do about it. That is an important phrase for your written and mental notes. It's not what happens. It's what you do that makes the difference in how your life works out. What happens is about the same for everybody. It's what people do that makes the difference. Anything can happen, right? I've heard all of the stories. Hey, I've been one of the stories. We could all tell stories for days on end. Anything can happen. Have you heard of Murphy's Laws? Surely you have. Murph had these laws. One of the laws was, if anything can go wrong, it will. That's one of Murphy's Laws. Anything can happen. I've fallen out of the sky so many times, once to the tune of a couple of million. Devastating. Took me a while to get over that one. Now, it wasn't all that much, but it was all I had. That's much, right? When it's all you've got. If you've got three and two go and you've got one left, you aren't looking that bad, but when it all goes. I'm sure you've had that kind of experience. Of course, a long time ago, when you ran out of money and got to zero, you were all through. Heck, now you can whistle right on by zero, right? They will bury you these days. But those are happenings. Everyone's got the same happenings. The big question is, 
what are you going to do about it? Someone says, yes, but you don't understand the disappointments I've had. Come on. Everyone has disappointments. Disappointments are not special gifts reserved for the poor. Everybody has them. The question is, what are you going to do about it? While we're talking about personal development and letting go of limitations, here are what I consider to be the biggest self-imposed limitations any man or woman has ever had to deal with. First, procrastination. Procrastination is particularly life-threatening because when we put something off, it doesn't seem, at the moment, to be all that important. At the end of the day, if you have let a few things slide, it doesn't seem like such a bad day. However, enough of those days piled up will make a disastrous year, and eventually, a disastrous life. Our inability to come to grips with a natural tendency to procrastinate will surely send us drifting in the wrong direction. Before you reach the final session of this program, you'll have left procrastination behind, if you're still troubled by it. You'll have discovered that it's simply too costly to put up with any longer. Besides, you'll be too excited about where you're going to postpone the activities taking you there. Self-imposed limitation number two. Blame. All of us have blamed others for our troubles from time to time. In fact, the tendency to blame someone or something goes back a long way. When there were only two people on earth, it wasn't long before they started blaming. The man said, it was the woman. She got me into this. And the woman blamed the serpent. Blame seems to be one of those negative tendencies that just comes naturally. The ego striving to defend itself. Remember the list I came up with to explain why I wasn't doing well? One of the items that was high on my list was prices. I told Mr. Schof that my problem was everything costs too much. However, he soon set me straight on that by saying, Mr. Rohn, that is not the problem. Let me tell you the real problem. You can't afford it. It's not it. If you keep dealing in its, you will always be broke, unhappy, and disillusioned because you will never have enough. Don't deal in its. Deal in you. When I finally learned to change my thinking from it to me, I changed my whole life. What a life-changing experience to finally meet someone who doesn't hesitate to put it on you or on your tendency to indulge in blame or procrastination. That is indeed a banner day when you meet someone who has learned how to skillfully and carefully Attack the same problem that has kept you from doing very well or kept you beneath your potential or kept you off balance as to your own self-worth. It is so easy to mistake appearances for reality, to confuse the symptom with the real cause. Along with blame comes the third negative tendency we want to eliminate. Excuses. Guess how many excuses we have? A million. And in the course of a lifetime, we will probably use them all unless somebody finally comes along and blows all those excuses apart to make us come face to face with the real reasons for our current dilemma. Until that time, we will probably use another million excuses to prevent ourselves from having a million dollars. Here's one of the major questions I'll pose to you during this program. What are you going to do starting today? that will make a difference in how your life works out? Good question, right? What are you going to do? See, if you don't do something starting today that will make a difference, guess what? It's going to be the same. And you can guess what the next five years are going to be like. Just look at the last five. The next five years will be like the last five unless you, major key, make all the changes. Now here's another key question. What can you do starting today that will make a difference? That's a good question. What can you do? What can you do with economic chaos? What can you do with massive disappointment when it's all gone wrong? What can you do when it won't work, when you've run out of money, when you don't feel well, and it's all gone sour? What can you do? Well, let me give you the broad answer first. Here's what you can do. You can do the most remarkable things, no matter what happens. Hey, people can do incredible things, 
unbelievable things. A man can do the most amazing things with the most impossible circumstances. A woman can do the most remarkable things with the most disastrous circumstances. Hey, I found out kids can do remarkable things. That is, if they have remarkable things to do. I also found out if they don't have remarkable things to do, there's no telling what they'll do. Now, here's why humans can do remarkable things. It's because they are remarkable. They are not dogs, animals, fish, birds, amoebas. Humans are different than any other creation. When a dog starts with weeds, he winds up with weeds, and the reason is because he's a dog. But that's not true with human beings. Human beings can turn weeds into gardens. That's one of the major differences, being a human versus being a dog. Humans can turn nothing into something, pennies into fortune, disaster into success. And the reason they can do such remarkable things is because they are remarkable. So why not reach down inside of you and come up with some more of those remarkable human gifts? They're there waiting to be discovered and employed. And with those gifts, change anything for you that you wish to change. And I challenge you to do that because you can change. If you don't like how it is for you, change it. If it isn't enough, change it. If it doesn't suit you, change it. If it doesn't please you, change it. And I challenge you to do all that because you can change. See, you don't ever have to be the same after today, only by choice. If you don't like your present address, change it. You're not a tree. Now for the process of change, just a philosophical pronouncement won't do. It takes more than that. And it takes more than enthusiasm. I know we are hearing a lot about enthusiasm these days. We're still hearing the old cliche of the 30s, to be enthusiastic, you must act enthusiastic. But see, that won't help. I'm sorry. Hey, after you have leaped about, there are some things you've got to do, or it isn't going to change for you. You can get all excited about lifting 200 pounds until you get to the gym. Then you need a new excitement. And the new excitement is discipline. Discipline, the major step to human progress. If there is one thing to get excited about, this is it. Get excited about your ability to make yourself do the necessary things to get a desired result. That's true excitement, not just optimistic panic. True excitement. Hey, what could you do starting today that would make a big difference in your life? Answer, no telling. What will some people do starting today? That's what's disappointing. It's not what we can do that's in question. What we can do is fantastic. What we can do is unbelievable. What we can do, it's what we settle for that's disappointing. Remember, the major question to ask on the job is not, what are you getting? The major question to ask is, what are you becoming? What we become is what leads to all the good things. And the habits we form, habits of mind, attitude, and behavior, are a dominant part of what we are becoming. Now, I understand, as well as anyone, that forming new habits doesn't come easy. But new habits will come when we change. It is usually not in one cataclysmic explosion, but rather by changing small pieces and parts at a time. I think that's how most of us change. We just keep nudging ourselves in the right direction, forming one or two new habits at a time, little by little, until finally we've made the turn. And this is where the good life comes from, those personal changes. There's nothing you can do with the seasons but there's everything you can do with yourself. Don't wish for the winters to change. Wish for your own attitudes, strength, and capabilities to change in order to handle the winters. Really making personal changes calls for 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Wishing we could change is a beginning, but now wish must be translated into activity, and inspiration and affirmation must lead to discipline. We can affirm that we are going to change, but we must now form new habits and develop new disciplines for the affirmation to come true. 
Make sure your activities are not going in the opposite direction of your affirmation. Make sure your daily thoughts and activities take you in the direction of your affirmation. Now in the personal development quest, there are three major aspects of ourselves to improve. We can look at developing ourselves spiritually, physically, and mentally. With respect to our spiritual development, this may be a major or a minor issue for you depending on your values and your goals. I confess to being an amateur in this field, but I think it's very wise for you and me to look at the spiritual side of our lives and decide what growth we want to experience here. Come to your own decisions as to what it will take to nourish your spiritual nature. Next, let's look at physical development. The body and the mind work together and depend on each other, so they both need attention. There's a Bible phrase that says, treat your body like a temple. So just put it in your notes, body like temple. Not a bad suggestion. Treat your body like a temple, not a woodshed. Now, in taking care of the physical, we must learn to be conscious of ourselves, but not self-conscious. We need to be aware of our physical appearance, our physical well-being, but not to the point of being self-conscious. We need to be aware, we need to take care, but some people devote too much of their day to physical appearance. Physical appearance is going to have something to do with your future, your well-being, your income, so do spend some time on physical appearance. How we appear to other people does make a difference in terms of our acceptance and our ability to function and do well in the marketplace. In fact, there's another Bible phrase that says, take care of the outside for people and take care of the inside for God. People look on the outside and God looks on the inside. Now, you might believe that people shouldn't judge you by physical appearance. Well, let me give you a clue. They do. Make sure you don't order your life based on shoulds and shouldn'ts. You'll always be confused and you'll always have trouble. The best thing to base your life on is reality. What people really do. So since people generally judge by appearance, then that's probably one thing we want to take care of. That's just part of the game. Now, of course, when people get to know you or if they've been around you any length of time at all, they're going to judge you by more than appearance. But sure enough, people at first are going to take a look. So taking care of yourself in personal appearance is a consideration. Now, physical development also includes your good health and your well-being. You've got to spend some time on that so that you feel good in the marketplace. Get involved in some form of disciplined exercise. Keeping fit and feeling good has a positive effect on your attitude, not just your appearance. Even if you're not into sports, there are some cassette programs and books on how to stay in excellent shape in only 20 to 30 minutes a day. Get the tapes and find your best way to stay physically fit. Just develop a bit of consciousness about taking care of yourself physically. Physical fitness pays great dividends in terms of your energy level, your ability to live a long, healthy life, and your general sense of well-being. The other part of physical well-being is nutrition. There are some excellent cassettes and books on this subject for you to investigate as well. Do all you can to stay fit, to stay healthy, and to stay well, because physical health and fitness affect how you feel about yourself and how you perform in the marketplace. When you feel good about yourself, other people will feel good about you too. Appearance, vigor, vitality, and well-being have a lot to do with how your life works out. That's the physical side. Now, the mental exercise and nourishment are just as important as physical and spiritual exercise and nourishment. You want to make sure that the acceleration of your mental health, mental well-being, and mental capacity keeps up with your physical capacity. So make sure at 40 that your mind has kept up with the passing of the years. Don't stay 30 at 40. Don't stay 30 at 50, keep up the learning curve with mental exercises. I congratulate you for your investment in this cassette program as a further expansion and stimulation of your mind and your thinking. 
It's so important for you and me to be stretched beyond where we are. It's too easy to just comfortably sit and stop growing. It often doesn't seem to be that necessary to make the push, to make the effort to learn and to grow and to challenge yourself. But let me give you something to think about. The last few years of the 20th century are going to demand a lot more mental vigor and mental activity. The competition and complications of life are going to truly challenge the full capacity of our mentality. So, stretch your mind. It's easy when you finally find yourself in a good job to stop pursuing mental development. Have you heard about the accelerated learning curve? From birth up until the time we are about 18, our learning curve is dramatic, and our capacity to learn during this period is just staggering. We learn a tremendous amount, very fast. We learn our language, our culture, our history, science, mathematics, everything. But guess when this learning curve starts to taper off? When we get our first job, usually. Now sometimes, for some people it will continue, but sure enough, here's where it usually levels off. If there are no more exams to take, if there's no demand to get out paper and pencil, why read any more books? Now you will just learn by some experience, just getting out there and by doing it wrong and doing it right and stumbling around. You learn some. But can you imagine what would happen if you kept an accelerated learning curve all the rest of your life? Can you imagine what you could learn to do, the skills you could develop, the capacities you could have? So here's what I'm asking you to do. Be that unusual person who keeps up his learning curve. Succeeding in life is not usual. It's unusual. You need to develop some unusual habits to earn the outstanding rewards. A friend of mine said, a standard education will get you standard results. You want a lot more than standard results? You need to become a lot more than a standard person. And now I've got some more good news for you. Never before in the history of the world has it been easier for someone like you or me to become educated, skilled, highly creative, innovative, and spilling over with profitable ways of thinking. I'm talking about making full use of audio cassettes like the one you're listening to now. You can turn your automobile into a professional growth seminar on wheels. I'm serious. Cassettes can turn the time you spend driving your car, dressing in the morning, or exercising into solid, effective personal development. While your friends are vegetating on the way to work, listening to the radio that doesn't help them one bit to do a better job, you're picking up new negotiating skills, better sales techniques, or a new creative way to solve problems. Keep building your library of fine, quality cassette resources. There isn't a better place you can put a few dollars every month. Become a student of good ideas, wherever they can be found. Always be on the lookout for a good idea, a business idea, a product idea, a service idea, an idea for personal improvement. Now, since forming these new habits of personal growth will require some discipline in the beginning, let me give you a key to discipline. Discipline starts with the little ones and works up to the big ones. Start with all the things you can do to make your life better and make you feel better about yourself. Make a list. Life will give you some pretty big challenges if you can handle the small ones. But unless you practice on the small ones and master those, you don't have a chance for the major ones. A man strides out of his house to go straighten out the corporation, and he has not yet straightened out his garage. Who's kidding who? So work on all the disciplines that will improve the quality of your life. And here's an important thought. Everything affects everything else. Every lack of discipline affects every other discipline. Mistakenly, the man says, this is the only place I let down. See, that's not true. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects every other discipline. Every new thing you try affects the rest of your performance. 
Isn't that exciting? So get started on every small discipline you can think of. You can't believe what it will do for your self-confidence. And remember, the greatest deterrent to success is lack of self-confidence. And lack of self-confidence comes from not doing what you could do. Next comes self-motivation. And really, it's the only kind of motivation there is. Self-motivation. I was on a lecture tour in Australia not long ago, and the press interviewed me. And they asked me, Mr. Rohn, are you one of those American motivators? I said, no, I'm a businessman. I can share my ideas and my experiences, but people have to motivate themselves. Hey, I found out you can't change people. They can change themselves, but you can't change them. Lord knows I've tried. I had a super group of salespeople back in those early days, and I said, I'm going to make them successful if it kills me. Guess what? I almost died. You can't do that. In management, we learn good people are found, not changed. If you want good people, you have to find them. That's the best answer I can give you. If you want motivated people, you have to find them, not motivate them. The first rule of management is don't send your ducks to Eagle School. Why? Because it won't work. I've tried it all. I picked up a magazine not long ago in New York, which had a full-page ad in it for a hotel chain. The first line of the ad read, We do not teach our people to be nice. Now that got my attention. And the second line said, We simply hire nice people. I thought, what a clever shortcut. Motivation is a mystery. Why some people are and some are not. Why does one person in sales see his first prospect at 7 in the morning and the other salesperson sees his first prospect at 11 in the morning? Why would one start at 7 and the other start at 11? I don't know. I call it mysteries of the mind. I give a lecture to a thousand people. One walks out and says, I'm going to change my life. Someone else walks out with a yawn and says, I've heard all this stuff before. Why is that? Why aren't they both affected the same? I don't know. I call it mysteries of the mind. A wealthy man says to a thousand people, I read this book and it started me on the road to wealth. Guess how many people of the thousand go out and get the book? Answer, very few. Isn't that incredible? Why wouldn't everyone go get the book? It's called mysteries of the mind. To one person you say, you better slow down. You can't work that many hours, do that many things, go, go, go. You're going to have a heart attack and die. And to another person you say, when are you ever going to get off the couch? What is the difference? It's called mysteries of the mind. Why wouldn't everyone strive to be wealthy and happy? I don't know. It's a mystery. So be self-motivated. Don't give that job away to someone else. The guy says, boy, if someone will just come by and turn me on. Hey, what if he doesn't show up? You've got to have a better plan for your life. Since you're self-motivated, and I would assume that you are since you've invested your money, and now you're investing your time to gather good ideas for more success, I want to share the best of what I've learned and experienced in my life. You deserve the best I have to give and more. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that this fundamental personal development is a major part of the platform, the foundation on which you can build.